locked in here on the Robert Elm Show on BBC London 94.9 FM. And we're about to talk about the life and talent of a fantastic actor. Um, I mean, I think anyone who's seen Ian Hendry in any of the films he was in, in any of the many television programmes he was in, will be aware that he was one of those actors who just sort of got it. The minute you saw him, you got the part. I mean, I... I'll think back to Get Carter or I'll think to The Hill and some of the classic kind of British character acting performances that he gave, but also in scores of television programmes over the years. And he was always an actor who somehow kind of held held your attention, even though he might not be the main role in any film. Um, I didn't know much about him as a character. I remember kind of seeing him a couple of times up in North London, now and about, every now and then. And I knew that he was sort of one of those that school of old-time, hard-drinking British actors. Um, but I know quite a lot more about him now because I've been reading a book called Send In the Clowns, The Yo-Yo Life of Ian Hendry by Gabriel Hirschman, who's here with us now. Gabriel, welcome to BBC London. Thank you very much indeed. What led you to want to explore the life of Ian Hendry? Well, he was the most extraordinary actor. He had an ability to create a character straight away. You know, when I was very young and I was seeing programmes like UK Gold, you would see him in The Hill or Get Carter, like you said, or... The Return of the Saint, or any guest spot in the TV programme like The Sweeney. He, was always, he seemed to always be in programmes yeah. like The Sweeney. Was... What struck me was he had an ability to transcend any class, like he could play like an aristocrat or a cockney hard man gangster and be convincing in any role that he played. He, he, had, he had that ability. He seemed to have a great stillness on, on stage, on screen. It seemed yeah, to he be. had a wonderful stillness, concentration. He had a wonderful voice and... He could become anything. He could become a psychopath. He could become an aristocrat. He could become a hard man, a shady character. He had a knack of playing weaklings or uh, heroes uh, or a snivelling coward or a forceful (laughs) leading man. He could play anything. He was extraordinary. Judy Dench, who I interviewed for the book, said he was the first actor... Actually, Judy Dench was in the uh, below Ian at drama school. Right. She said she was the first actor she ever saw who was born an actor. It was clearly born in him. Where, where was he born? Where did he come from? What was his background? He was born in Ipswich in 1931, and he went to the Central School quite late when he was about 22. He had time Working to Working class background, by. or what was his... No, it wasn't, actually. It was Colford School, which is a bit an independent school. He right. was quite, came from quite a good school, but the irony was he played a lot of... Gangsters, yeah, you know, because he sort of had that aura somehow, or could summon up that aura, I guess. Yeah, you know? even in his final role when he was ill at 53 and he looked about 73, but in the producer of Brookside said he transcended class, you didn't know really what background he came from. I think that was testament to the success of Ian as an actor. Was he a successful actor straight away? Yeah, he was on The Avengers. He was on the very first series of The Avengers, 1961. And then Honor Blackman took over because Ian was very desperate to land leading parts in films. And he thought he had a film career that would take off. And then he was in uh, Live Now, Pay Later, Children of the Damned. He was a good-looking young guy. He was a very good-looking young guy until he turned about 40. And then, you know, his... Life took its toll. Lifestyle, the hard-drinking, hard-smoking lifestyle took its toll to a certain extent. Was he ever going to be a star? Was he... I mean, was he sort of... Why wasn't he a star? If he's in the way that you know a Michael Caine who he played alongside, or what you know, were the big leading actors? Why did he always seem to be in those second? He was underrated. Roles? Now, whether I mean that is, uh, I don't think that's any evidence of any shortcoming in Ian. I think it's just getting the break. He competed for Michael Caine for the lead role in Zulu. Yeah, he was in Live Now, Pay Later, The Beauty Jungle at that time. If he would got the role in Zulu, then he might have got Alfie because Alfie was uh, very similar to. The live now, pay later role he'd done. If he got the lead role in something like Alfie, and then Get Carter was a, a role that he had in the bag. What uh, as the lead? Yeah, Get he had the lead. Uh, Mike Hodges, who made the film, he wanted Ian as the lead, and then Michael Caine came over and he'd done the Italian job at that point. Yeah. And Michael Caine said, "No, I want that role." And that was <laughs> end of story, basically. <laughs> end of story, but but great he, film, but and little doubt he, whatsoever. Ian and actually, really his piece in that is fantastic. I mean, he, Ian got. He was nominated for a BAFTA award as a supporting actor. And strange enough, Mike Hodges didn't actually know that when I told him it was very funny. Yeah. Um, now, as you say, he, he was very, clearly very respected as an actor and very, very good at it. But what, how early on in his career did the failings start to make themselves apparent? Because he did have failings and he did become quite a troubled man, didn't he? 
Yeah, for sure. I think in the 60s, Ian had always had a reputation as a very heavy drinker. But, you know, so many actors of that generation were. Yeah, I mean, that's no great surprise if you're a sort of male, good-looking mm. kind of actor who's part of the scene in the 60s, mm. is it, really? No, I mean, all the contemporaries of Ian, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, Ronald Fraser, James Villiers, or not only the big stars, but... Oliver Reed. Players. Yeah, but they got that big, big role that catapulted them to world stardom. You know, if Ian had got Get Carter... We might be sitting here, you know, there might be five books about Ian, but he was unlucky and uh, he was underrated. In his, under- in, as we've said, he did have issues with drinking from fairly on. Or, or I don't know if they were issues with drinking from early on. He was a hard drinking man and he was part of that milieu and that world. He also had an eye for the ladies, perhaps is right to say. Or maybe the ladies had an eye for him. Yeah, I think he got on very well with women, well, certainly, yeah. <laughs> and he married, he married quite, quite a couple of times. Janet Munro was the most famous one and he adored her and the marriage was a tempestuous affair. Right. A bit like Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton. Very stormy affair with a lot of rows, ups and downs. Was he, a, was he a, a volatile man in that sense, would you say? Yes, I think he always was a volatile character, yes. I think maybe the great artists are always volatile. You know, they're not going to come home and as I guess I said in the book, they're not going to collapse in a sofa and read the Financial Times. They're the kind of people that are going to go after the filming has ended, to unwind from the stresses, they're going to have a few drinks and maybe uh, cause a few arguments. So. <laughs> yeah. And so he had a few of those. At what point would you say did it start to to kind of inf- affect his career, his drinking and his carousing? He did a stuff? television series called The Lotus Eaters in 1972. Which he's very, famous. he's very good in, isn't he? A wonderful TV series. Again, before its time, and I think before its time could so have been in his heart, whole life really but the the lotus eaters janet died halfway through the series right. and he took to quite heavy drinking and his behavior was becoming more eccentric and then he was relegated to supporting part in films but he was wonderful in the internet sign project with james coburn and uh, then a whole host of tv parts but the 70s was a desperate period anyway Unless you're a really big star like Sean Connery, Michael Caine, Anthony Hopkins, then you were relegated to supporting parts. He was just waiting for the phone to go. But he kept working, didn't he? He kept working steadily till uh, the early 1980s, yes, he did. He he kind of held court up in Hampstead a bit, didn't he? Yeah, he was always at the Bull and Bush pub and the Heron Hounds. You would always find him, Ronnie Fraser, James Villiers... Yeah, Ian Henry definitely was a pub man. I mean, he loved going to pubs and things like that. I've had an email from one of my listeners, David Newcross, who said, as soon as you introduced the, the, the idea that you were talking about Ian Hendry, my mind went back to when I met him. I was for a while, a long, long time ago, a dispatch rider. I had a job one day delivering something to Ian Hendry up to his home in North London somewhere. Hampstead, I guess. Um, it would have been a script or a contract that required reading and sending back, a wait and return, as it's known in the trade. Most people keep scruffy, smelly dispatch riders like me waiting on the doorstep, but not Mr. Hendry. I was invited in, sat down on the sofa and given a glass of Guinness. And then when I left a short while later, given a tip. What a gent, says Dave in New Cross. You know, it's funny. When I read the book, and when I wrote, <laughs> you wrote the, book, the book, when I wrote the book, there was nobody who knew Ian Hendry in the business who had a bad word. So hardly anybody had a bad word to say about him. He was always known, very nice to his fans, very nice to everybody, very nice to the public in bars, pubs, cafes. Uh, I'm not surprised by that story. He was very generous with his time to everybody. You know, you can... Other hell-raising actors like Oliver Reed, obviously, you can hear bad stories yeah. about how they treated people. But do you know? You don't hear those stories. It was a very nice I was going to say, because you've interviewed lots of people who knew him and worked with him. How is he remembered by them? Remembered as an extraordinary actor who was underrated by the public and by the critics, but in the business by fellow actors, he was known as absolutely one of the best. And people learned so much from him. They really did. How did his end come? Because it came all too soon, didn't it? He had a lot of health problems towards the end. He looked much older than his age. I mean, yeah, as you say, at 53, he looks like a man in his late 60s. But when he did Brookside, his last acting role, he looked like uh, 70, yes. And it's kind of sad right. that his last acting role is, is, yeah. is uh, you know, to, to all, all credit to Brookside, but a second-rate soap opera, basically, for a very first-rate actor. And even that, it was difficult for him to get the role. Uh, he was, he'd been unemployed for quite some time. At did that he point, have money troubles? Yes. Uh, he didn't give a lot of money. In fact, hardly anything, I think. 
Uh, well, again, the high tax of the time, plus the fact, I suppose you've got to keep enough money back to pay your tax, which maybe Ian as an extravagant character didn't. And then Janet Munro died owing quite a lot of money. Uh, he but, married yes. again, didn't he? Yes, he did marry again, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he seemed to have a twinkle in his eye even to the very end. Perhaps. Sure. But in well, in Brookside, uh, yeah, just to go back to the Brookside thing, yeah, he, he was ill, he had a throat tumour, which, of course, is the worst possible thing to have as an actor. Right. He had a jinx over him. I think he had bad luck to a certain extent. Bad luck. Bad luck. Bad, bad luck towards the end, yeah. Bad luck, but great talent. Wonderful actor. And uh, tomorrow I'm signing copies of the book at Westminster Central Hall for a memorabilia film convention, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Brilliant. Uh, all so, kinds of other people are going to be there. So the book is Sending the Clowns, The yes, Yo-Yo Life right. of Ian Hendry by Gabriel Hirschman. It's available by Lulu and Amazon on the internet. And you can get a copy tomorrow. Tomorrow, Westminster Central Hall, 10 to 5. I'll be there. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Gabriel, thanks for coming in. <laughs> thanks very, very much indeed.